Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Holly Wilcox, a suicide prevention expert at Johns Hopkins, about the U.S. suicide rate, which is up 35% over the past 20 years. They discuss how the pandemic has increased many of the risk factors for suicide, with loneliness and grief on the rise, and a record number of people requesting new access to firearms, which are involved in half of suicides. Let's listen. Holly Wilcox, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. I appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about suicide, which I know you're an expert in. And I want to talk about how the suicide rate has been rising in the United States. Tell me about that. So the suicide rate has increased when we look at data from around the year 2000 to present, about 35% overall in the population. But there are some groups where you see more of an increase in other subpopulations with less of an increase. Obviously a concerning trend. Definitely. What is behind it? So I wish we knew. Suicide is a complex and multi-determined problem. So there's no easy answer and no really direct solution. Things to keep in mind is that suicide is really influenced by different health factors like depression, substance abuse, serious mental illness, physical pain, people living with chronic pain. Also environmental factors, access to lethal means is one really important target for prevention. Stressful life events and living in situations where there's low taboo, community where there's low taboo against suicide, and also communities that have been experiencing lots of financial strain. There are also historical factors like having a past history of suicide attempt. Uh, past history of uh, adverse events, traumatic events happening during childhood. The interesting thing about suicide is that many other countries have seen a decrease. They've been able to reduce their rates. So there are answers. There are definitely things that we can do to improve the situation. It's just going to take some work and rolling up our sleeves and sitting down and, and really digging in. But we do know that Because suicide is a multifaceted problem, we need to have multifaceted approaches and solutions. And we need more of an investment and a better investment of the current resources that we do have. Should I talk about some of those solutions? Sure, please go ahead. So number one, we really need to improve access to affordable and effective mental health care. And when we speak about mental health care, one major obstacle, a barrier, a stigma, stigma about being the recipient of mental health care. And so that's another thing that we need to focus on and and take into account when we're working toward that goal. We also need to invest in community interventions, coordinating suicide prevention across healthcare, social education and, and employment contexts. Limiting access to lethal means is huge because over 50% of suicides in the United States are by firearm. And so thinking about how to restrict easy access to lethal means is a really important thing for us to be doing nationally. Reducing loneliness is especially salient right now in the COVID pandemic. But in general, this is something to think about and to think towards trying to have community-based interventions and outreach that can help reduce loneliness at the population level. Also, strengthening economic supports is something, another solution that I think will be especially beneficial thinking about COVID and the toll that it, it could take and how to strengthen communities. Also, expediting access to linked data 
that can be used for action is important. A lot of the data sets that we use for action, there's a, a two to three year lag, like the National Violent Death Reporting System. And I know the federal government's working on this, but oftentimes we can use data to figure out where the hot spots are and you know subpopulations that we need to adapt interventions for, have better targeted outreach. But when we can't access the data, it's really problematic because you know, we could use those data to really target solutions. The last thing that I wanted to mention is this idea of, you know, we have a lot of approaches that work that are there, either policy solutions or different programs. But unfortunately, there's oftentimes there's a lag in moving research to action. And there's certainly one of the biggest problems in the field is that oftentimes we have these programs, but they're not spread. And when they are spread, they're not sustained. Oftentimes, these best practices are supported by grants that are kind of strung together. And so when the the money dries up, the program goes away, where Champion moves out of town, (laughs) the, the programs are not sustained. And so we have to think about working with policymakers. We have to think about working with, you know, more cohesively with healthcare systems and trying to get them to administer some of these best practices and embed it in the way people do their job every day. You know, they're just embedded, they're baked into the system. And so these best practices become just the the part of our business, the way we operate, the the way we care for patients and students and employees. And doing those things will make a big difference. You've given us a lot to think about already. The pandemic. Let's talk about the pandemic. So it sounds like a lot of the things that you brought up, economic issues, social isolation, are worsening during the pandemic. Does this concern you about what's going to happen down the road with suicide? I think the suicide prevention community is very concerned. At times of unrest, like we're experiencing now, the rates haven't always increased. Oftentimes, if there's prolonged economic issues and a real high toll of bereavement and grief that happens as the results of you know, a situation like this. You can see a higher toll with suicide. And so we are worried, but we are optimistic that we will be able to you know, recover and there will be support that will be able to help facilitate the recovery. And I understand there's really no data yet on COVID and suicide. That's right. There are data locally. For example, the state of Massachusetts looked at their data on suicide deaths from March to May of 2020, and they did not find an increase. But in order to access data that quickly, you need to have really strong partnerships with the medical examiner's office. And oftentimes the data, it takes a while to finalize the data. Some of the deaths are pending. And in order to confirm the cause of death, it it takes a while. And many settings are reluctant to release those data to the public until that process, you know, you've gone through that process of of checking and double checking and confirming the data and making sure that they're as accurate as possible. You mentioned that 50% of suicides are due to firearms. And I understand that we've had a lot more people buying guns during the pandemic. So I wanted to ask you sort of if that's something that also concerns you? Yes, it's a major concern because of the availability of more firearms. Another concern is the the individuals that went out at the beginning of COVID to get background checks and to buy firearms may not be as experienced. And the storage practices may be different in in that subset of the population. But in general, Firearms are really important to think about for suicide prevention because oftentimes suicide is impulsive. And if there is easy access to lethal means when someone's in crisis, there is a greater likelihood, a threefold greater likelihood that they could use that firearm for their suicide. And if somebody makes a suicide attempt using a firearm, their survival is very unlikely. Maybe less than 10% of people who use a firearm for suicide will survive. And if someone uses another type of method, their survival is more likely. So what can we do, you know, going forward? Obviously this is a huge problem. 
Yeah, it is a problem. And and I do think we need to just come together and revamp the way we're doing things right now. And I do think we need to learn from other countries that have shown improvements and success. And we need to think about how to structure the funding that we have towards best practices and policies and programs that really work. And how do we get those out versus, you know, these other types of approaches that don't have the level of evidence. But the biggest thing that I think we need to do, you know, like people like myself who have been in this field for decades, and one skill that we don't learn in public health that we should be learning is how to work with policymakers. And that's a skill that needs to be honed and acquired, and it's something you need to work at. And I think that's what would make a really big difference is to be able to communicate with healthcare systems and with policymakers and make the case and show the data and be able to, you know, work in partnership with these folks, because really that's the way at the community level, at the state level, nationally, where we're going to see impact is if we're able to engage these folks. Oftentimes, suicide is not seen as a priority. Like there are always other priorities. And unfortunately, we have to have a stronger voice in the field and bring it to the attention of these policymakers and these folks that it is a problem and that it is a preventable problem. And these are the steps that we need to take to to solve it or to, to make a difference. And there's a particular concern about young people, isn't that right? That's right. Can you tell me a little bit about why you think the young folks are the ones who are at higher risk? Sure. One difference between adults and youth ties into something I said earlier with impulsivity. And so oftentimes young people, when they're in crisis, they may not see that this will resolve and there will be, there will be a future, that this will pass and things will get better. And so young people, especially young people with easy access to firearms in their home, you know, that's a major concern. Oftentimes young people rely on their parents to help them get to treatment. So that's another thing is not only for young people, do you need to engage the individual, (laughs) but you have this other step where you really need to engage the parents and get their buy-in and support for getting these young people the care they need. And so there are a lot of factors that, that could play into it. Oftentimes in suicide, there are uh, generational issues. You know, there, in the different generations, there have been different cohort effects and different problems that we see. And this Generation Z, which is our young population right now, under 26 or so, and they seem to present with more anxiety and more depression at least on our national survey data, as compared to other generations. And so those are things we need to keep in mind when we think about prevention programming in schools and at universities and thinking about how to best prepare the mental health workforce. Oftentimes, you would think that mental health providers would know how to do a suicide risk assessment or would know how to properly screen for suicide. And and that's not always the case. And you would think that these evidence-based treatments would make it into the community to, you know, different practices in the community, community mental health centers, and, and oftentimes they don't. And so we have to think about ways to be able to better prepare our mental health workforce and to better support them to be able to do more. Oftentimes what you see is there's a window of opportunity where a young person will be identified. And then if they go in to see this provider and, and things don't go well, they could, they could kind of give up on it at that point. And so it's not always a straightforward process. Sometimes it takes a while to get in to be seen and sometimes it's not a right fit. And so you have to think about just keeping this persistence in place to try to get them the help they need. Holly Wilcox, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Stephanie. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.